What's up, family? I hope you're doing fantastic tonight or whenever you're watching this. And if things are not well, then let me speak this over you right now, that things are getting better. Yes, matter of fact, go ahead and speak that over yourself. Put this in the chat. Things are getting better. Yes, and I'm Pastor Patrick Damon, just in case you're joining us for the first time. I have the privilege of pastoring one of the greatest churches in the galaxy, Covenant United Church of Christ in South Holland, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And I have the joy of hanging out in this virtual space called Word Therapy on Tuesday nights. Each week we engage in teaching messages that are designed to help put you on a path toward healing and wholeness because we believe that there is miraculous medicine right here in the manuscripts of scripture that can change your whole life. Let me warn you that we don't serve milk here. We only serve meat in this spot. I'm trying to give you something that's gonna fill you and, and stick to you that, that you can use in your everyday life to elevate your life. It's education that hopefully leads to transformation. And we're continuing tonight in a series we started last week called The Power of a Renewed Mind. Somebody scream this in the chat, say, the power is in your mind. That's why you have to get your mind right so that the power God has placed in your mind can be translated into something productive. If you receive that, just go ahead and put some fire in the chat. All right, I'm so excited about tonight's lesson. Let's get started, but first let's open with a word of prayer. And God, we thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for your love and your kindness toward us, for all that you have allowed us to do and see and experience that has been a blessing to our lives. And I thank you right now, God, for this opportunity to be used as your vessel to teach your word, oh God, to teach principles that can be used, oh God, for the forwarding of our lives. We thank you for the awesome uh, mission that you have given us as a body of believers, and we pray that we will be able to enact that mission through what it is that we take in and learn on tonight. We thank you, we love you, we give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Listen, by way of recap, our foundational scripture comes out of Romans chapter 12, beginning right at verse number one. I want to read that for you again. Romans 12, verse one, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's kind of our foundational scripture. That in order to be uh, transformed, in order for you to be in the world and not of the world, it necessitates you having a mind change, a renewed mind, a mind whose thought pattern and core beliefs are shifted from who you used to be to who you are. As a review, one of the things we established last week is that when you become the new you in Christ, you bring the old uh, way of thinking with the new you that your mind is not automatically renewed simply because you have a new life in Jesus Christ. So that it necessitates an intentional shift in your thinking in order for your new thought process to be parallel with your new life. Now here is our premise for tonight. Possibility thinking is the end result of a renewed mind. Possibility thinking is the end result of a renewed mind. Now, possibility thinking can be defined as the exercising of your faith. When I exercise my faith, the exercising of my faith becomes the end result manifestation of a possibility thought life. 
Are we together so far? Because your faith is what causes you to believe that things are possible because of the God that you serve. It is your faith. In Luke chapter one, you remember when the Holy Spirit was talking to Mary about giving birth and and she's a virgin and she asked the question, how in the world is this going to happen? Her thought pattern is that this can't happen because I've never slept with a man. The Holy Spirit says to her, well, the Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. Now, in her thought process, she's like, I don't know, even know what overshadow means. And then the Holy Spirit says to her in Luke chapter one, verse 37, let me show this to you. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now, a little later, we're going to come back to her response. But my point in that scripture is this. The capacity of my thinking should match the capacity of my God. Oh, that's good. Let me say that one more time. The capacity of my thinking should match the capacity of my God. If I believe that my God has the capacity to do the impossible, then my faith has to believe that God can give me the ability to do the impossible. So now let me give you something else. When you think with possibility in mind, you have the ability and potential to change situations. I say it again. When you think with possibility, it gives you the potential to change situations. It's about kingdom thinking. Drop that in the chat. Say kingdom thinking. Now here's the thing. Kingdom thinking attacks problems, defies negatives, and develops winning strategies. Let me give it to you one more time. I want you to get this tonight. Kingdom thinking attacks problems, defies negatives. It does not say it acts like negatives don't exist. It defies the negatives and defies that the negatives have authority. Please hear me. It's not living in some illusionary world like there aren't negatives. It is defined that you have to be what the negatives say. And then develops, watch this now, kingdom thinking. Kingdom thinking sees the problem, refuses to be defined by the problem, and then develops, here it is, Winning strategies to overcome the problem. Ooh, that's powerful. Kingdom thinking never sees a problem it can't solve. Because when you have kingdom thinking, you know God will speak to you and give you strategies to win in spite of the problem. Boy, I hope y'all are listening to me tonight. So kingdom thinking involves, listen to me, not only in revelation, but regiment. Are you hearing me? Uh, revelation that God can do anything. Regimen that part I play in the discipline of my life to bring about success in the areas where I thought it wasn't possible. When you are a kingdom thinker or a possibility thinker, you learn to find good things in the worst situations. You know that there, there could be a positive outcome even in a negative situation. Now, here's, here's the next principle. Your faith can either be a conduit or a cancellation of the supernatural in your life. It is possible for there to be the manifestation of the supernatural in your life. And your faith can either be the conduit through which God channels the supernatural or your lack of faith can cancel the ability of God to do the supernatural. Okay, you need Bible for this. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. In Matthew 13, verse 58. It says this, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Don't miss this. It did not say he could not do. It said he did not do. And the reason he did not do is because their lack of faith blocked his ability to make it happen. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? Their inability to think beyond the capacity of their limitation thinking caused a cancellation on the possibility that was available. It was their inability to see beyond the fact that this is the carpenter's boy. And so their limitation thinking caused a cancellation on the possibilitizing power. Let me show you something else. Go over to John chapter 11, verse 21. John 11, verse 21 says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 22. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the light. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Verse 26. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Now, we always stop right there. That, that's the shout for us. But but that's not the point. The next question becomes the point because what he is will not translate into what he does until the next question is answered. Do you believe this? Do you see that? Jesus said, now you're not believing it does not change who I am, but you're not believing it will determine whether who I am translates into what I do. You're not believing he's a provider does not make him any less Jehovah Jireh. Your inability to believe he can heal you does not make him any less Jehovah Rapha. Are y'all with me? It just prohibits him manifesting that part of who he is in your life. Jesus' ability to operate in his identity was predicated on her belief system. Stay right there in this same story and go down to verse 38. Watch this. Verse number 38. Same woman, same sister. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, this is the same sister, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there is a bad odor for he has been there four days verse 40 then jesus said did i not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of god don't miss that he he's already said to her do you believe this now the way she's talking means she really didn't believe it so jesus turns back to her and said didn't i say to you no let, let me reword the grammar didn't i say that you would see the glory of God if you believe. Help somebody with this in the chat. Say it's based on what you believe. Now go over to Numbers chapter 13. Let me show you something else about possibility thinking. This is another story that everybody in the word therapy crew knows we talked about it uh, before in previous lessons it's the story where god sends out the spies into the land and they're supposed to come back with this report and they come back with the fruit of the land in their hands you remember that they they come back with the fruit in their hands that became the evidence that it is what god said now look at verse 30 and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Do you see that? Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. I want to pair this with another scripture in order to give you the principle. 1 Samuel Chapter 17, verse 26. Now watch this. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Go down to verse 29. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? Verse 30. He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. Verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. I don't want you to miss this. In the first instance with Caleb, there were opponents and enemies blocking the blessing. In the case with David, there was a giant blocking the blessing. In both cases, there was possibility thinking. Caleb said, we can do this. David said, I can win this. Here's the principle. The shift came through their mouth. Come on, I need y'all to get this tonight. That the shift in their thinking was evident in what they confessed. Caleb didn't keep it in his mind. He spoke it out of his mouth. We are well able to go up. David didn't keep it in his mind. David brought it out of his mouth. See, let me help you with this. Possibility thinking cannot remain a thought, but it has to be translated into a word. Please get this tonight. Mark chapter five. Y'all remember that? The woman with the issue of blood. The Bible says when she heard that Jesus was in town, she went out because she said to herself, if I can touch him, I will be made whole. She makes a confession on her possibility thinking. In the text where it says she thought to herself or she said to herself, it is in the aorist tense in the Greek, which means she kept confessing it and she kept confessing it and she kept confessing it. So you have to develop along with your thought life vocal confessions. And you have to keep confessing it no matter what's trying to get in your way. You have to keep speaking it no matter how impossible it looks. She just kept saying it. If, if I touch him, it'll happen. If, if I touch him, it'll happen. If I touch him, it will happen. She never says, I hope this blood stops. She never says, I hope nobody stops me. She never said, I hope nobody gets in my way. All of that is possible, but that's not what she was confessing. She just said, if I get to him, everything will be all right. If I touch him, my problem will dry up. It has to be a vocal confession. Now, let's go over to Proverbs chapter 18, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. This is good. It says, from the fruit of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled with the harvest of their lips. They are satisfied. Here's what that means. My life will be filled by what I say out of my mouth. Because my mouth is a tool of productivity. So what I speak will be produced in me so much so that I start to look like what I say. Oh, that's good. That, that, that's why folk who are always talking negative start to look negative. That's why folk who speak depressing language start to look depressed. But conversely, that's why people who speak faith always look like they're on top. They are not being phony. They are not holy rollers. They, they just look the way they talk. Drop this in the chat for somebody. Say, you are what you say. You are what you say. The Bible says your life is filled with what you speak. Now, go over to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. It says this, therefore, take no thought, saying, stop right there. 
Take no thought saying, I need you to get the picture of what I'm saying. Take no thought saying, did you grab that? Here it is. I take it when I say it. Y'all better come with me tonight. The, the word there in the original Greek is a word that means ownership. It means to capture something. It is like the picture of uh, walking by Reese's cups in the store. I love Reese's cups. And you know, you like, you like, you love those Reese's cups and you look at it and say either I'm going to take it or I'm, good, I'm just going to know it's there and keep going. Jesus says when you speak it, you take it. Now, if I don't speak it, I see it and keep going. If I don't speak it, I say, now, Lord, I don't have any business having that thought. I bring it under subjection to the power of the Holy Spirit. I cancel it in the name of Jesus and I keep going. But the minute I speak it, I take it so that the thought does not have power until I take it until I speak it and I don't take it until I say it y'all I am dropping jewelry tonight <laughs> let, let me go a little deeper the word thought there is the same word worry take no thought can also be translated do not worry which means worry is birthed through the seed of a thought you don't start worrying until you impregnate yourself in your mind with the sperm of the thought. God help me tonight. You're not worrying about something because it is. What do I mean by that? So, so you have a bill that's due tomorrow and you don't have the money for it. That doesn't make you worry. You have a doctor's appointment to go to because they told you they need to talk to you about something that they saw. That doesn't make you worry. You haven't had a job in two months and, and you have bills that are stacking up. That doesn't make you worry. What makes you worry are the thoughts you start thinking about it. Jesus said, take no thought for your life. I'm in the word. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They twirl not, neither do they spin. And if your heavenly father takes care of them, how much more will he take care of you? Which means I don't care what the doctor told me. I'm going to the doctor's office saying by his stripes, I have been healed. I do not care how many bills I have. I'm declaring God's going to make somebody on the other end of this phone have favor with me and give me more time. And then God's going to give me the resources to pay every bill. Situations don't cause worry. Thoughts do. God, if that didn't help anybody, it's helping me. <laughs> Let, let's keep going. Ne next principle. The, the renewal of the mind into possibility thinking happens when you uproot old ways of thinking and plant new ways. A renewed mind is an uprooted mind. Now, now that's a difficult because that means you have to uproot stuff that's been planted there for a long time. Here's the reality. All of us have flawed core beliefs. All of us, all of us have have some beliefs that have been established by painful experiences, repeated stories, unexpected situations. And some of those things established in us bad theology. For example, ladies, you, you didn't come out of the womb thinking all men are dogs. That core belief was established through an experience or experiences of hurt. So now your core belief that men aren't any good is a flawed core belief that was established by experiences. So that flawed thinking, whether that is about yourself, others, or about situations, it has to be uprooted. You have to uproot what is not beneficial to your productivity and success in God. Now, let me warn you, as you go to uproot flawed thinking, as you go to uproot strongholds that the enemy has established in your core belief system, let me warn you, it will not happen without challenges to it. 
hear me tonight, your commitment to maturity will always be tested. So as you try to mature in your thinking, please don't think the enemy isn't going to challenge it and that God won't test it. Are you hearing me in the chat? So when God starts testing, it's not meant to break you or turn you around. Let me tell you this. When God tests you, it is to prove who you really are. Not to him, but to yourself. Did you hear what I just said? When God tests us, it is to prove to us who we really are. That's good right there. Drop, drop some fire in the chat. Because testing always reveals true character. Now, I read this somewhere. To think like God and to think in the possible and the positive, you have to move from being what one writer called an impulsive actor to being a deliberate thinker. In other words, stop being so dramatic. Stop being a drama queen and a drama king. Stop bringing the drama every time something happens in your life. Because as long as you bring the drama, you will always have impulsive thoughts and impulsive actions. Because your drama dictates your actions. This is good. You, you, you can't be full of drama and think positive. And with possibility, you have to be a deliberate thinker. Don't be the person that makes quick decisions. So you drove by the parking lot knowing you can't afford it. But because you are an impulsive actor, the drama in you raises up because of how good that car looks. And, and then you stop and the salesperson starts talking to you about what they can do and, and what they could put you in. And, and, and you, you won't have to put any money down and, and you know you can't afford it, but, but, but you can't even hear that because the drama inside of you has brought you into an impulsive moment. Oh, I know I'm telling the truth. It, it, it requires focus and mental toughness. So you have to replace limitation thinking with limitless thinking. Because when I start thinking limitless, when I start believing nothing is impossible with God and I start thinking with a limitless potential, it develops in me creativity thinking. Let's deal with that for a minute. The road to creativity thinking is getting outside the box, but staying in the Bible. <laughs> Let me say it one more time. You, you got to learn how to think outside the box, but stay in the Bible. Okay, let me let me go back. Remember Luke chapter one. I said we we're going to go back there when the angel said to Mary with God all things are possible. The angel said, listen, it's going to happen for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Do you remember Mary's response? Let's look at it. Luke chapter one, verse 38. And Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. In other words, she's saying, I'm going to be pregnant without the assistance of a man. See, at that time, they did not have in vitro fertilization and all of that. So that's outside the box. But it's inside the word because the angel is the one that said it. Y'all not ready tonight. Let, let me give you another example. Go over to a few chapters to Luke chapter six, Luke chapter six, verse thirty eight. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall people give into your bosom? So when I give, God is going to bring people into my life of resource and influence who will pour stuff into my life just because I gave. That's outside the box, but it's inside the word. Now, here's where we're going to land tonight. I want to talk about thinking that blocks possibilitizing power from being created in your life 
through the supernatural power of God. Here's the first form of thinking that will block the supernatural. You've got to avoid corrupt thinking. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. In other words, I couldn't talk to you all like you all were mature, Paul says. I've got to talk to you all like your babies because y'all are still acting like and thinking like uh, your, your babies instead of spiritual people. You see that? He says, I, I give you milk, not, not solid food, for you were not ready for it yet. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. I want to give you meat, Paul says. But by your actions, you are revealing to me you can't handle it because you are still worldly. Here's why you're worldly. Because you are operating in envy and strife and divisions. He said you are worldly, you are carnal because your thought process is causing you to act in ways of division so that corrupt thinking is thinking that is solely based on natural knowledge and instinct. It's earthly and fleshly and devoid of divine wisdom. Now here's where some of you won't like this. Natural knowledge and intellect, though valuable, can also be dangerous. Being an intellectual can be a danger to spiritual people. Because while all of that can give you natural skills, it can become a liability to your success. Because your success is spiritual. And there are some successes in the spirit that your mind can't comprehend. Oh, I'm going deep into the sea, but I'm giving you life jackets to keep you floating. But hear me, you will never intellectually be able to understand that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ask and think, which means there is a certain level of the ability of God that goes beyond the capacity you have in your intellect. And you're going to miss God if all you're depending on is your intellect. You ever run into those people who think they are smarter than everybody else? And they try to operate in God's kingdom on their intellect and their smarts. You cannot operate in God's kingdom on your intellect and education. You have to go above that or else you will limit your opportunity to experience the supernatural power of God at work in your life. Listen, I believe in education. I have three degrees to prove it. But there comes a point where you can think too much. <laughs> And there comes a point where you can overthink some things at some point when it goes beyond your capacity. You have to stop thinking and just start trusting. Stop thinking and just start believing. Stop thinking and just start taking risks that if I step out of the boat, he's going to let me walk on the water. Because if you start trying to be intellectual, you're going to feel the water overtake you because your mind is telling you you're supposed to sink. Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Verse three, I want to look at an amplified version. Romans chapter 12, verse three, for by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you not to think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has apportioned to each a degree of faith. In other words, you ought to think of who you are based on your faith, not on your intellect. When it comes to operating in the spirit world, I can't operate everything in God's world on book knowledge. Some things God does goes beyond the ability of intellectual understanding. Here it is tonight. 
thinking void of spiritual influence can become self-intoxicating. This is a carnality that results in arrogance. And arrogance is when you start to feel you are beyond correction and direction. When you start to think, can't nobody correct you? And when you start to think, nobody can direct you. You have carnality in you. The minute you think nobody can tell you anything, the minute you think you're so good that nobody can tell you anything, you are worth nothing to the kingdom. Get off your high horse and let God teach you something. Don't get self intoxicated. There will always be people that you sit under and learn. Listen, I'm not the best preacher or teacher, so I have to submit myself to the direction and tutelage of others. None of us should get to the point where we believe no one can correct us and direct us. I got to keep going. The first one is avoid corrupt thinking. The second one is avoid conditioned thinking. Let's go to Colossians chapter two, verse eight. In verse eight, it says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Here's a definition of conditioned thinking. Conditioned thinking is thinking that is based on intentional indoctrination with the objective of controlling beliefs and behaviors. If I try to indoctrinate you, to control you, we are no longer a church. We're a cult. If I try to control you to the extent that you think everybody outside of covenant isn't saved and everybody whose name is not Damon can't preach and teach, we have ceased to be a church and we have become a cult and you are in idolatry and I made myself a demigod. Now, let me say this on the flip side. All conditioned thinking isn't bad because possibility thinking becomes a discipline that conditions your mind to think a certain way. Stay with me. The only conditioned thinking that is bad is what Paul just said in Colossians. It is that which is contrary to the orders of God and the principles of righteousness. When you, are con when you condition yourself to think in ways that are contrary to what God says, when you let people condition you to think that you'll never be anybody, that's not what God said. When you let people condition you to think that you'll never uh, be marriage material, that's not what God said. When you condition yourself to believe you're just going to be broke all your life, that is not what God said. Most people that try to indoctrinate you, indoctrinate you because they want to control you. God's not trying to control you. He's trying to liberate you to enjoy life everlasting. And in the midst of enjoying life everlasting, you submit to the Lordship that gives him control. Because God isn't going to take control. You're going to have to give him control. Teach tonight, Patrick Damon. He's not going to take control. You're going to have to surrender control. Here's the next one. Avoid cluttered thinking. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. We know this story. It's the story of Mary and Martha. In verse 38, it says that Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. <clears throat> Verse 39. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset 
about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. To get this, let me give you a definition. Cluttered thinking is attempting to deliberate while your thinking is scattered, disconnected, and fragmented. It makes planning, learning, and strategizing difficult for you. Some of you are cluttered right now because you're watching this, but you have several other things in your environment that are vying for your attention. You're cooking, watching something on another device, homework with the kids, doing chores, you're cluttered. And I understand it because even as a pastor, sometimes it's hard for me to worship on Sunday morning because I'm thinking about all the stuff that needs to happen and the announcements I need to make and who is responsible for this and why does this sound like that? I'm cluttered. Now in the text, it's very interesting to me that Jesus never calls what Martha is doing bad. He doesn't even call it unnecessary. Jesus just says it's untimely. Because when you have been afforded the opportunity to sit at my feet, it's untimely for you to be doing anything else. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Folk texting you while you're in church. You ought to put it on do not disturb while you're in church. And see, the devil has you and you don't even know it. Because he's got somebody sending you a text or you have a Facebook thought. You just have to post it at that very moment that the spirit of God has something to say to you. And because you were cluttered in your thinking, you missed the revelation you needed to handle what's coming your way tomorrow. He said you're cluttered. And Martha, because you're cluttered, you're missing out on what is best. But then the Holy Spirit messed me up with something. She's not just missing out on what's best, but because she's cluttered, she can't even be her best at what she's doing. It was so simple. You may have missed it. She's preparing the dinner and fixing the table. It's not the best thing for her to do. But because she's so cluttered, even the things she's doing, she can't do the best to her ability because she's too busy and distracted. Listen, cluttered thinking always results in what I call disorganized multitasking. You know, people can multitask, but you know, you, you got some people who multitask and they never finish any of it. You start this and, and, you, and you start that and you're multitasking and you don't ever finish any one of the multiple things you're doing. Because you're cluttered. And now watch what happens. Now you're trying to multitask and, and because you got this kind of divided thinking and because you got this kind of cluttered thinking, now all of a sudden you're looking at all these things that you might have been able to do if you put your time in prioritizing them. And now you start feeling overwhelmed. You're not overwhelmed because you just have so much to do. You're overwhelmed because you're cluttered trying to multitask. And that kind of thinking and living always results in oops endings. Oops. I didn't know it was going to end like that. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Oops, I didn't think that's how it was going to turn out. A am I on your street? So, so, so let's end it right here with thinking that liberates you for possibility. Here it is. You have to learn to think correctly. Let's go to John chapter 17 John chapter 17 verse 17 John chapter 17 verse 17 he's talking about his disciples he says sanctify them in other words 
consecrate, separate them, make them holy by your truth. Your word is true. Did you hear that? So then to think correctly is the discipline to make decisions based on the word of God. To think correctly is to discipline yourself where every thought is based on the word of God. It means you weigh every situation against the standard of the word of God. It means you don't take the doctor as the last word. Y'all not ready for the supernatural. You don't take the loan officer's denial as the last word. You teach your children not to take that teacher's word as the last word. Come on now. Talk to me in the chat. It is refusing to get derailed by emotional distractions. You're all mad because of what somebody said you couldn't do. It doesn't matter what they said. They don't have the power to make it happen or stop it from happening. So why are you getting emotional about what somebody thinks about you when they don't have a heaven or a hell to put you in? And they don't have the power to do anything in your life. Have at it, boo. Have your opinion about me all you want. But before God gets through, he's going to prepare a table in the very presence of my enemies. That means it's my banquet and I don't have time to argue when it's time to eat. Come on now. Correct thinking means I don't accept anybody's opinion as non-negotiable. I don't even accept what you think are your facts as non-negotiables. That woman with the issue of blood, the fact is every doctor she went to couldn't help her and it made her more sick. Those were the facts. But the woman said, that's not non-negotiable. If I could just get to him, it doesn't matter what they told me. It doesn't matter if they told me I'd never get the loan to open the business. It doesn't matter if they told me I wasn't college material. It doesn't matter if he told me if he walked out on me, won't nobody else want me. That is negotiable. Here's number two. Learn to think concretely. What do I mean by that? Let's look at Romans chapter four, Romans chapter four, against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Look at verse 20. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. See, too many spiritual people don't know how to strike a balance between the spiritual and the natural realities. Always be aware of the natural realities. Abraham was old and his body was not capable of procreation, natural reality, but that didn't stop him. And he did not allow that to override the promise of God, that this is still possible because God said it. Now the natural reality is I don't have the natural ability to do this. But because I serve a supernatural God, I'm not going to let what I know in the natural reality override what I believe about the supernatural. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, concrete thinking chooses to override facts with faith. It's when I choose not to allow present conditions to dictate future possibilities. Now you have to admit the natural. You have to admit the obstacle. You have to admit the difficulty. Can I tell you why? You have to build a profile. You have to build a profile of the obstacle and the difficulty and the challenge in the natural because it helps you to target your faith. Come here. Faith has to be targeted. So you target your faith at what the natural is trying to say can't happen. 
come here. G Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to that mountain. That's what Jesus said. And say, mountain, be thou removed. There was a target of faith on the obstacle of the mountain. Don't walk around acting like you don't have trouble and you don't have struggles and you don't have difficulties. Acknowledge them and target your faith right at it. Every difficulty, acknowledge that it's there. Don't act like it's not there, but then target your faith right at that difficulty and start speaking to it as if it cannot stand in your way. If the doctor told you you got cancer, don't just target your faith and call it sickness. You call it cancer and you target your faith to say, I'm healed of cancer. Here's the last one. Learn to think courageously. Courageous thinkers become known for making stuff happen. When you are courageous, you motivate other people to move from indifference to action. See, courage is the established will to act with boldness. Drop that in the chat real quick. Say boldness. Boldness in the face of difficulties while you're pursuing goals and depending on God. One author put it this way, courage writes the check and potential cashes it every time. I love that. See, see, courageous people handle situational pressure and step up when other folk procrastinate. See, too many people know how to identify problems, but don't know anything about developing solutions. Courageous people see beyond the present difficulty into what could be. Here's the courageous thought. No weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. I see the weapon forming, but I'm looking beyond my present difficulty to a reality that by faith, I know it can be. Here's a courageous thought. If I wait on the Lord and be of good courage, he will strengthen my heart. Here's a courageous thought. If I wait on the Lord, he will mount me up with wings as eagles. I run and not get weary. I walk and not faint. Be courageous in your thinking. It's your thinking that is going to put the pieces of your life together. If you start thinking, I can't do this, you'll quit. If you start thinking this won't make it better, you will quit. But if you start thinking that all things work together, there's some stuff that's hurting you right now. There's some stuff that has you in that emotional place. But if you can shift your thinking, God can change your status. God can change your position. God can change your attitude. God will strengthen your faith and help you believe that what you thought wasn't possible is still possible. Let's pray. And God, we thank you for the cultivation of possibility in our lives. Thank you, God, that by your spirit, we can stand in the face of that which looks like it can't be and we can declare that it can be. Because we know that in Christ, all things are possible. And so, God, we place ourselves in the path of your possibilitizing power and we ask God that you would give us new eyes to, to see that which we saw in a certain way previously, to see it in a different way. To see God that you are still able to do things that we previously thought could not be done. We believe that all things are possible in you. And we believe, God, that even the most difficult things that we face right now, we declare, God, that you're still working and that you are still able. God, we've declared, we stand on faith 
that you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. We stand on that right now and we thank you in advance for what you are preparing to do as we continue to walk in this new season. Thank you, God, for beginning the work of renewing our minds. In Jesus' powerful name we do pray. Amen. Listen, I hope these principles taught in this lesson have stirred something in you and made you think about things in a different way, made you see things in a different way. That we can begin to, to look at some things that we previously pronounced could not happen for us and begin to cultivate possibility thinking. Some of us are witnesses that God can do what seems impossible. Some of us can testify about stuff God did in our lives that left us scratching our heads. Matter of fact, God has some of y'all in the place of success where you're saying, man, I didn't even know I could be on this level. It starts with your thinking. And as I said last week, one of the areas we have to change our thinking is in the area of generosity. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And we read that, but a lot of us don't believe it. We don't believe that God could open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. We don't think it's possible. That's why God says, try me, prove me. You have, you have to develop the courage to trust God enough to try God and try God enough to trust God. Listen, the lower third is on your screen. Why don't you try God tonight? By sowing into what you know is good soil, by investing in the ground, the soil that is producing a harvest in your life. And I thank you in advance for putting your trust in God. Listen, I gotta get out of here. Don't forget to like and subscribe as always before you log off that helps us to get the word out to as many people as possible when you do that simple act of liking and also subscribing so that you can stay in the know when we go live uh, with the things that we place on this youtube channel i hope you have an incredible week see you on next tuesday same time same youtube channel Love you in the Lord. Love you to life.